Well, my very special guest today is someone that we've had many times years before, <laughs> and it's Warren Hunter, all the way from, he used to be from South, South Africa. Africa, but what was in Johnstown? Now we're in Branson, Missouri. No, no. Where were you in South Africa? Janus oh, Janusburg. Janusburg, South Africa. And now they're in Branson, Missouri, but forget it. They're all over the world. Yeah. Uh, you just came back last week from Africa. Yeah, on uh, Wednesday from Nigeria. And, and here he is today. <laughs> and we just did a, a Spartanburg two-day event. We had a whole, um, we did an event called Amped. We called it Awakening Mankind's Powerful Eternal Destiny. We brought a bunch of churches together. My son actually put it together. And we had all kinds of uh, praise and worship bands for two days. And then I ministered in between that. We prayed for the sick. Um, we have like every kind of activity going on, bouncy houses, you name it. Uh, everything going on they in that park. Those? Oh yeah, for like two <laughs> days going on in that park. It's amazing. So it was a wonderful. It was very time. good. A lot of people. Were, we prayed for a lot of people. People were falling under the power of God on the grass. You know, it's, it was incredible. But uh, it has been awesome. We just we've been you know going to Nigeria about twenty nine times. Now, are the Muslims coming out in Nigeria? Yeah, in Nigeria is. If you think about it, in two thousand and one, we've gone from almost. They say about 13, 11 to 13 percent uh, Christians in like about 2,000. And if you think of 2015 now, they say almost 60 some percent are Christian. Are Christian. So however you want to look at it, the Christians are taking over. Uh, we were with um, Pastor Enoch Ataboya, the head of Redeemed Christian Church of God. Uh, Tommy, Calvin, myself, we all met with him. Um, and we were at his crusade in December. There was over about what about three million people four million he, they, they've actually had up to seven million in one meeting and wow and when you look at this thing it's like you can't think you, got, you uh, can't fathom seven no. million it's like what well, Tommy can tell you one mile long one mile long and one mile wide holds about wow. three point some million a and uh, when we met with him he was he he sat with us on the lounge and he was adamant he said he said um, the, in a certain amount of years, he guaranteed that the Muslim stuff, we'll as far gone. as he's concerned, will be literally wiped out of Nigeria. So you don't have ISIS there or any of that? Well, they have the Boko Haram. Remember, they captured all those women, all the children. But well, actually, the other day, when we were there, right before we came, they rescued over 700 children, children. and women from Boko Haram. So the Nigerians are fighting back. Good for and them. And they have a connection with ISIS and all that. But there's such a tremendous confidence in the word there. And we had such incredible miracles. It has been, I can't even begin to explain, the power of God is so powerful. Um, we actually did a, when we were there in December, I did one message one time where I was just talking about Genesis 1, where it says, God said, God made, God created, God blessed, God called. You know, like yeah. every verse in Genesis, when you go along, it just says like, God, God said, God yeah. made, God yeah. called, God created, God blessed. Well, while I, while I was dealing with this, we were in a, in a meeting and we had done the meeting. It was so funny because I said, everyone has back problems, everyone has an e-pro, everyone has any kind of problems, I want you to bend down right now. And suddenly thousands of people in this meeting were instantly healed. And it was so funny because then I flew back right off to that. And when I got home, we were going to like a, what do you call one of those stations, you know, where you um, put air in your tire. I climbed out of the car and there was a ledge and I slipped and my ankle twisted. And it was an ankle that I had damaged before several times. So I fell on the ground, I was holding it and I was in absolute pain. And I'm lying there uh, on the ground in total pain, you know. And my wife walks over to me and I hadn't even had time to think. And she says to me, she says, you're the man of faith. You just say, stand up, walk, be healed, thousands of miracles. There was, in that one meeting we had before we left Nigeria, there was like four or five people time in our wheelchairs. Incredible miracles we had. And the word of knowledge and the accuracy of the miracles was absolutely amazing. So she's here telling me, oh, you're the man of faith. You just say, get up, walk, be healed. And before I could even think, you know, reason out. She just said, she grabbed my hand and said, stand up. Well, I stood up. When I stood up, it went. I was just like walking. I was like, and then I started laughing. I said, you tricked me. Yeah. Because you didn't give me time to reason. And that's something yeah. that happens with people sometimes. Yeah. If they, if they, God is so good, he's so powerful. But when they take time to try process or reason something, it's like delays, you know, it just delays that miracle. And it's like, 
it was just kind of funny. My wife was giving my own treatment to me <laughs> on, a, on something that happened in Nigeria. Yeah, right. <laughs> just rise and walk. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Well, um, you've been doing these crusades now all over not just Nigeria, but other Yeah, places. Brazil. We've been to several countries. But we are working right now. What happened was while we were in Nigeria, we have made contact with several leaders in different countries. So we have a contact that we're working with, like connecting with different countries with these. You see, Redeemed Christian Church of God has something about 300,000 churches. So in different countries, they're talking literally in Spain and Philippines about bringing all their churches together. Wow. Once they bring all their churches together, we'll be able to pack out the stadiums. So the idea is years ago, actually Terry Law, you know, when I was born in South Africa, like mm -hmm. June the 5th, I'll turn 49. But when I was born in South Africa, that's so funny, 49 years ago, when I was born in South Africa. you little kids yet. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Terry Law was there when I was born. And later on, when I, was, when I came into ORU, when I was a freshman at Oral Roberts University, and we came to, you know, we came to America in like 82, 83, Terry Law prophesied over me. He said, I see you going to over 100 nations of the world. And he gave me a prophecy. He said, the stadiums of the world will become your pulpit. Well, at that point, it was like you're thinking, I mean, that was a big, yeah. but now, it's like you can see it's getting closer and closer towards that because in December we had a campground. I don't know exactly how many, but you can see the warehouse was long. There might have been 100, 200,000 people. But we had, we had a lot of people in this campground near the airport in Port Harker where, where about 100 and some thousand redeemed Christian Church of God people came together. And the meeting was so powerful. Uh, Calvin played drums. My wife was singing. Tommy was playing keyboards. But we have had such incredible meetings there. The last time we went there, we went to a church called King's Palace. And when we were at that church, my wife started worshiping. She had a vision. And they could not contain the people in the church. You know, this is like one of the biggest redeemed churches in Port Hardcore. Probably 15, 20,000 people. I'm not sure how many. Because what happens is you can't tell all the people because outside the building, on the sides of the building, they got thousands like this, thousands. Every crevice, you know, the land is full. Then across the land, just down the front, they had another field with over another 20 some thousand people oh my goodness how did they put screens oh and big stuff? screen yeah but this one was amazing when my wife started singing uh they were worshiping god and while they were worshiping god she, she told me she said i had this vision i saw angels around the whole field and they're ready to heal the people the anointing got so heavy when i stood up on the pulpit i was standing like this and i can't explain i felt like a almost like a tornado going through your body like a power i'd never felt before and when I felt that power go through my uh, body, it was like, I just said, okay, everyone in the whole field, there's angels around there to heal you. And when I went, Jesus, I mean, it's like in that meeting, we had the entire choir fall in the power, the whole balcony fall in the wow. power. But outside the meeting, the crowd, they said almost 15, 20,000 people fell in the power of God. Wow. And the next thing you know, the whole night, people were picking up crutches, walkers, people were walking. They said for months after we left the church, the pastor told us, this was back last year, for months after that, people were testifying of the miracles. And it was God just like, did. it is so powerful. It's like, you know, and that's the thing is that people don't understand how good God really is. He is such a good God. They don't understand how powerful. The, I, it's almost like, you know, like when you go into the sun, the sun shining down on you. The only way you could, you, you have to put up an umbrella to block the sun. Right. And I think a lot of times people get into reason, doubt, unbelief, all this. And they're literally blocking the goodness of God trying to shine down on them. It's like last night I was praying for someone in a meeting and uh, we actually just went there. We were doing like a birthday thing before we came down at this house. We were in Moore and uh, South Carolina and we stopped by this house and I did not know. I thought this couple just invited me for supper. So I get there next meeting like 40, 50 other people show up and my wow. family surprised me because of the birthday. And when we were at the house, I started praying for this uh, one girl. And one of the things I said to her was while I was praying for her, and even in the morning when I was at the church in Daphne, I was preaching up in Gaffney Sunday morning. When I was praying for this one girl, I noticed while I was praying for her, she could not really see the goodness of God. I said, do you know that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you? I said, have you ever thought about just receiving his prayers? Do you think his prayers will fail? I said, sometimes what you have to do is you just got to say, Lord Jesus, I receive what you're praying for me. See, Jesus is praying for us. People don't understand that. He even prayed yeah, for the disciples Jesus. before he left in John 17, 22. He says, Father, the glory that thou gavest me, give them. I give them that they may be one just as we are one. Jesus is praying for you. He's praying that the fullness of the will of God, 
You know, that's why Paul prayed all those prayers, because Christ wants the, His fullness to be developed in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And think about Jesus is seated at the right hand. I was down in Cholston preaching with this pastor on that. The Lord said, just preach on receiving the intercession of Jesus. And it's like the pastor was like, what are you talking about? I says, have you not just, do you think that what Jesus is praying for? No, no, no. Listen to me. If you're watching on camera, Jesus is praying for you. So and a lot good. of times what we have to do is we've got to receive it. If Jesus is praying for you, that tells you how good he is. It's like, he, he, you know, it's like God is so awesome. You know, what you need to do is you need to receive that prayer and say, Thank you, Father. I receive your love. I receive what you're praying for me because I'm going to tell you something. It's not like Jesus' prayer can't be answered. It's just you need to receive it. Yeah. Just like you receive salvation. Right. Just like you receive grace. You have to receive it. And a lot of times that's what people struggle with. Sometimes people struggle to be loved. And God loves us so much. And when people struggle to be loved, you can see why they'd have a hard time seeing how good God is. And he's so awesome. So I want to hear what happened. Now, you, you're in Nigeria, and you know you have to get back over here. Because you a fuel crisis. This thing. There's a fuel crisis. Okay. Isn't that, isn't that strange? In a country where there's so much oil, it's the number one oil country in Africa, Nigeria. They have more oil than any other country. And one time when I was going through Nigeria, I think I told you the story about when they stuck the machine guns to my head uh, because the militia was stealing the oil. And I had the situation happen where I actually had machine guns stuck in my head one time. But Machine guns? Oh, yeah. I've had some situations in Nigeria that's been absolutely outrageous. Uh, let me tell you that one, and then I'll tell you the airport one. Uh, we were actually, one time I was, I was in a place and I had a dream. In the dream, I literally saw people shooting bullets at me. And when they were shooting the bullets at me, it would come right close to me, and then suddenly the bullets would fall to the ground. And I was like, there, it was a very interesting dream. And then suddenly I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, uh, what's going on here? And the Lord spoke to me and said, don't worry about anything today. In the dream, he's like talking to me. I've assigned a special angel to you today. And then as I was walking up, the scripture came to me about, we were like them that dreamed. Then was our mouth filled with laughter. And our tongue was singing, for the Lord has done great things for us. And the Lord said, you will laugh today. Just laugh. <laughs> so I woke up, and here we're going down the road. And we, we're on dirt road, you know, dirt path. Suppose we go, see, they pump the oil one place, and then they have the, you know, like the oil pipelines, like, uh -huh. like we're doing with the Keystone or whatever, the pipelines, to where the oil needs to go. But they have to take it somewhere for refineries. See, the problem in the country is they don't have refineries. So they're shipping raw oil out. If they had the refineries, it would be easier for the people. So they have to ship the oil out, and then they bring in the oil back to their people. That makes it expensive. It makes it expensive for them, but not only that, it's created a problem because the government has not been paying the people properly. The, some oil situation conglomerate in Lagos owing them billions. So basically, they wouldn't send out uh, fuel this last time when I was there. So that country ends up being a fuel shortage. So when I was driving just from Port Hardcore to the airport, over 10, airline, 10 gas stations as I was going, every one of them was shut down. Thank goodness the guy took me. And some people had keep like oil, you know, in cans aside. And of course, they always pouring it in their cars, you know. And, but that specific day while I was going along in that bush experience, we curved a bin and suddenly a bunch of guys jumped out. Well, the next thing you know, I've got like three, four machine guns stuck to my head. And when that happened, I cannot explain it. The joy of the Lord came over me so strong. <laughs> I literally, my head went back like this, and I was like, <sighs> I was Probably freaked them yeah, out. <laughs> I was laughing with uncontrollable joy. Uh -huh. You know what it means when you're so drunk in the Holy Spirit. It yeah. was like I cannot explain it. The joy was so powerful, and I was just for. Tw and they pulled them out of the car, and they kept saying "Ibu, Ibu, Ibu," which means a white man. And what they were trying to say is, Dr. Joe is with me as a professor from upstate New York, um, who's got a church, Vineyard Church in the Bronx, was with me as well. And he heard them say, take that white man out and shoot that white man dead. And he actually you heard, heard him say that? No, he heard it he in heard their language. In their language. Say it several times over. And was he white or black? No, he was black. All the, yeah. And the guy with the machine gun behind me was black, and then another driver was black. They pulled them all out, but with me, I just kept laughing, and they just kept holding the machine guns. They didn't know what to do. <laughs> and about 20 minutes later, I was still laughing. So after a while, after about 25 minutes, they just sort of gave up. They climbed in the car, and off we went. <laughs> well, we get to this church, and it's so funny. It's, uh, Dr. Okafa, is, um, we get to this Goody Okafa in Abba. We get to this pastor, and the minute we arrive in his church, uh, Dr. Joe climbs out, and he's like this. <laughs> <laughs> and he comes to the pastor, the pastor's like, and he's like, oh my God, he said, this guy's crazy, you know, talking about me. 
And he told him what happened, how I kept laughing, and they kept trying to tell him that it would kill me. But I knew I had a dream. And the other thing that was so powerful, so when we were leaving, we got to the airport, you know, now trying to come back. Oh, my Lord, I had paid for, a, you know, you paid for a ticket on one airline. That ticket, it was called Medview or something. This airline was not coming. In Nigeria, it's not like, we'll give you a break, we'll transfer the ticket, you get your money back, nothing like that. All day long, I'm trying to find a way to get out of there. No, now you have your family with you, too. Oh, no, no. They weren't with me there in uh, Nigeria, thank goodness, on this trip. They've oh. been with me before. Okay. They've been with me before. But this specific trip, when I was trying to get out, finally, I was in a situation where I was sitting there at the airport, and I had my contacts calling Lagos. And I was sitting there, and I had my, 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 my phone. I had some data I bought on my cell phone for Nigeria. Uh -huh. So I was going in there saying to everybody in America, you know, I'm on Facebook going, please pray, pray for, for me, me so that I can get <laughs> out of Nigeria. <laughs> <coughs> and I'm sitting there, like, doing this. And the next minute, you know, they said, okay, there's a plane going to come from Lagos. Now, the plane was going to be late, like 7. They were flying, and it had enough fuel to fly back. They said, this one will have fuel to fly back. So I had to go buy another last-minute plane ticket, even just get on that one. Wow. You know what I mean? Because, they, you know, they're ridiculous. I had to spend hundreds of dollars. So I get on that plane, and thank goodness there's this lady who's very wealthy, very respected, everybody you knows. She's the government all that. And she's sitting right in the front of the plane in front of me, and she tells the people on the airline, she said, don't, know, don't you know who this is? They said, no. He said, this is Warren Hunter. She said, this is a mighty apostle of God. He's preached, and she named like four or five of the biggest, all the biggest pastors in that region. And so suddenly there was like an awe and respect, you know, came over. And she said, you cannot get off the plane when he arrives. You need to. So when we were arriving, they announced, no one get up. Because they got to let the man of God out for me to get my. Because they knew. I mean, isn't that unusual? Yeah, because the, with the timing was so strategic. And Delta said we had to be in before 8 because the plane was going to leave. You, they didn't want to do any checking after that. So we actually arrived about 8, 10 or so. But as I ran off the plane, I had several people. One guy grabbing my luggage, one guy throwing a vehicle because you have to go from the local international. When I got there, I was the last. When I got to the counter in Delta, everything was shut down. They kept one guy because we had, had they, the guy on the plane who was known. And he knew the head protocol person at Delta. So as the plane was landing, he called him o over to Delta and said, there's a guy coming. Hold it open. He was some, you know, somebody they knew Someone and respected. With yeah, with authority. We had all these people with authority helping me out. It was incredible. One leader after another making something happen. Even the guy who got me from Port Harcourt to the airport was one of the most wealthiest people in Port Harcourt. And he had me in this Land Rover. He had the fuel, was able to drive me all the way to the airport. And then when we got to that terminal, I was the last one to check in. By the time I got to the plane, I was the last one to climb on the plane. And then I made it. And you made it. To Atlanta. <laughs> it was you know, it's amazing what God will do when it's... Uh, you know, when you're in His perfect will, yeah. He'll always take care of you. But a lot of times we can be in His perfect will, but we don't exercise the prayer language. We don't exercise, That's right. you know, coming and saying, Lord, I need help here. Yeah. You know, a lot of times it's like the church I was at Sunday morning, I was trying to explain to them. I literally was preaching a message and I was dealing with what I call unnecessary spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. And unnecessary spiritual warfare is because like Jesus said, Satan cannot find nothing in me. Mm -hmm. God cannot be tempted. Satan cannot find nothing in me. I mean, Satan had nothing to work with. Because Satan likes unforgiveness. Satan likes bitterness. Satan likes resentment. Satan likes anger. You know, when you start, it's very interesting how the enemy works. Isaiah 45 or 7 says, in the beginning, God created good and God created evil. Isaiah 54, 16 says, God created the destroyer to destroy. And then even Jesus said, Satan is a murderer and a liar from the beginning. Satan's food is dust, it's carnality. Satan is attracted to everything that comes out of you that's not of God. And it's like, what's so amazing is like, um, sometimes people have rejection. You know, that's what the enemy worked in Eve. He began to work on the fact that in the day that you eat this, you'll be like God. Like, you are not good enough. You're not worthy enough. You, you understand how the enemy, he loves, he loves it when a person doesn't know who they are. He loves it when a person feels inferior. He loves it when a person feels condemned or shamed or not good enough. Or he loves this stuff. Satan loves this stuff. And the problem is people go through so much garbage because I've shared before that 
One of the most powerful things is when you walk out the nature of God, you silence spiritual warfare. People don't understand yeah. that, for example, I always tell people, I don't have the capacity or the ability to give God the love He requires. But the love of God is shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. And when I love myself with the love of God, when I love others with the love of God, and I love God with the love of God, it's like, it's like at that point I silence the enemy. Because it's perfect love casts out fear. All fear. But what happens is, it's like I always say, when you walk out the nature of God. So it's almost like, and then some people you almost have to navigate in the Spirit. Because the love of God should have by the Holy Spirit. Some people like when you pray for them, I'll start praying for them and you have to wait because I don't think there's any situation that cannot be solved. So you'll be dealing with them and while you're dealing with it, you might see like yesterday I was praying for a guy last night. And while I was praying for the guy last night, it's like I started seeing grief. Uh, I started seeing process. It was like, it wouldn't have been a process, but it became a process because as I was praying for him, he said, I've got this problem going on. Well, when I started praying with that problem, it was like, as I was praying about that specific problem, God began to reveal to me that there were several other things connected with that situation. So many times what happens is you might have a certain problem or have certain things, but you have to understand one thing is that Satan works with Satan. Satan doesn't cast out Satan. Satan works with anger, animosity, jealousy, strife, and contention. And you might be watching and dealing with something. Sometimes what happens is somebody can be tuning in the, in the show and it's like, it's like God wants to do something great for you, but what happened was because you are purveying, let's say, the spirit of rejection or spirit of unworthiness or, or you just feel like God can't use you, when you start even talking that way, the enemy gets yeah. excited. Satan loves it because remember, Numbers 14, 28, Jesus said, say to the children of Israel, whatever you say, I will make sure I bring it to pass. So it's like some people, they, they talk about their weakness. No, God said, yeah. let the weak sound strong. So you might be going through something. Don't be talking about um, how unworthy you are, how inferior you are, or what you're yeah. struggling through, or what you're going through. Remember, God said, bring me in remembrance of my word. My word yeah. And, you know, I encourage you to get into God's word today, to walk out the nature of God. What do you mean? Love, joy, mm -hmm. peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness. kindness All us. these things make your will strong, and a strong will sustains a man. And so it's like you have to build up that inner fortitude, you know, like an infrastructure. You've got to build up your fortitude where love is what's dominating. The fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, righteousness, is, is what's also coming out uh -huh. of your vocabulary. Yeah. It's what you're speaking. Because, you know, we are, we are unto God the fragrance of Christ. Yes. And I was telling someone, some people the other day, I said, you've got such a stinking attitude. When you've got a stinking attitude, the devil likes a stinking attitude. Yeah, he does. The devil likes it when you've got a bad attitude. The devil likes it when you, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm this, I'm blah, 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 blah. Oh, the devil loves that stuff. You know, and the other thing is, and you said, when we speak it out. Yeah. And when you say, this person's against me, this person's against me, this nobody likes me, I'll go eat worms. Well, let me tell you something. Oh, Satan That's loves what that. you're eating. Yep. Because you just opened the doorway for Satan to work That's in right. your life. That's right. But if you start taking your power and authority, it'll change. We're I love that stuff because it's a mystery. Yeah. You know, it's like, I, I, I you know, it's like I'm watching everything, and I, I don't think it's going to happen the way people think things are going to happen. Because I believe a lot of things are going to change very drastically. One time I was in Siberia, and I had a vision, you know, and it's like in the future, and I literally saw, like, people literally stopping time like Joshua again, and thousands were coming to Christ, and I saw almost almost like a great synergy it was so powerful in the future like that scripture that says in ephesians you know that uh, 110 it says all things in heaven and all things in earth will become one in christ and it was like i saw something so powerful about what was coming in the future and i believe what people think is going to happen and what is coming is not going to be exactly quite tell me about that well because the bible says how shall we neglect so great a signs and wonders you know, I, I believe if I remember the, the, the verse, you know, there's some things that Scripture, like, it's the way it says it. It says in Hebrews chapter 2, For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty, how will we escape if we neglect so it's great a great salvation? salvation. Yes. Now, it'll go question mark. Then it'll answer it actually in verse 4, because it says, After it was first spoken through the Lord, 
it was confirmed by those who heard it. Now, the way you read it is really to get what he's saying, the answer is like, how will we escape if we neglect great salvation? Verse 4, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So, God showed me that there's going to come a time, just like it was during Joshua. This, this, you'll, you'll love this. Many times we see scripture, but we look at it from a different angle. For example, the Bible says, as it was during the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. What people are not looking at is what was God doing. See, they're looking at the circumstance. Here's Noah preaching. Yeah, he's building an ark. Yeah, the, his family in the ark. The wicked are removed. Noah actually is on the ark. When the waters subside, you know, the Bible says the righteous will inherit the earth. Okay. We know the time period, all these different things. And so there's a prophetic element there. But the element people are not is what was God doing? And one day God spoke to me and said, don't look at what, look at this from the way I see it. I said, what do you mean? He says, no, what was I doing? He said, I was preparing a vessel of deliverance. 30 cubits high, 50 cubits wide, 300 cubits square. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, 30 cubits, every time we see the word 30, we speak of maturity. Joseph, David was 30, Jesus was 30. 50, you know, is Jubilee and all the aspects mm -hmm. with that. And you know, when you run through 50 through scripture by itself, you're going to get a massive relation. 300 cubits, Gideon's 300 army. But the 300, when you put it all together, the 50, the 300, and the 30, and you go to Solomon's temple, which was 300 cubic squares, all these things correlate to the fullness of the body of Christ. You understand, when we, by the time we get to the book of, uh, for example, when I look at um, Ephesians, it says, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, every name that is named, not only, and Ephesians 1.20, and to put all things in subjection under his feet, gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So God spoke to me and said, no, you've got to see it from my perspective. I am preparing a vessel of deliverance. The vessel of deliverance is the body of Christ. The vessel of deliverance is the body of Christ. And this is something that people have to see. We become the Ark of the Covenant. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You see, so the dimensions or the reality of what he's saying takes on a different meaning. And many times people are looking at things prophetically, but they're not looking at it. It's almost like you just got to change the way you look at it. Does that make sense? And then you see the whole future in a different perspective. So this is, uh, and so uh, there's, there's much things like this. I actually preach for an entire hour. The, the other one that's very important is just while we're talking about this, I should just share this anyhow, is the Lord began to speak to me, and I, did, I was doing a message called Now Faith, Now Glory. <clears throat> and when I was doing the message Now Faith, Now Glory, I was dealing with the dimension of Amos 9.13. See, Amos 9.13 says, the plowman will overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that sows seed. When we deal with Amos 9.13, we're dealing with drinking the juice before the seed touches the ground. You remember, Jesus said, the plow will overtake the reaper, the tread of grapes. When I went to Cape Town, the guy there, he's treading the grapes, and then, you know, you, in those troughs, they're still doing it. If you go to the vineyards, you'll find some guy still stamping on the grapes, and out comes the juice. But he's basically saying, you will drink the juice, you know, before the seed touches the ground. How can that be? Now, I'll have this one. What happens is, uh, when we go into Hebrews, it tells us that, it says, Hebrews uh, what? Uh, let me go here. It says in Hebrews chapter, here it is. Hebrews chapter 9. For there was a tabernacle, verse 2, Hebrews 9, 2. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one in which were the lampstand and the table. And the holy sacred bread is called the holy place. Behind the second veil, look at this. Behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant. Do you notice something? It's also in there. The golden altar of incense now is in the holy of holies, not in the holy place. In the Old Testament, the golden altar was only in the holy place. Wow. Yeah, there's a revelation here. If you go through and look up the golden altar in the Old Testament, it's always in the holy place. It's always placed where the menorah is yep. and the table showbread. But 
year, Jesus say, no, it is, it is past the second veil. There's a revelation. Remember the golden altar is the fragrance. The worship comes up before God. This is the worship, perpetual worship. That, remember the priests had to come in in the morning? Yes. And remember one was the prayers and intercession of saints, and then we'd come in with the coals of that, and one represented praise and worship to God, the morning and the evening. Remember there's a whole mm -hmm. deal here. Now that golden altar, I was doing a study on the Day of Atonement. They said that on the Day of Atonement, no one could go into the Holy of Holies except the high priest, the one who was going to go into the Holy of Holies, could go into the holy place. If they came in, sometimes they would come in. By the time they would leave just the holy place, I'm not talking about the holy holies. When they would leave the holy place, when they went outside, there was so much power on them. Remember, they had to take their robes off because if they took it and they went amongst the people, remember the power of God was still on them. Remember one time they went into the holy place and got the fragrance from the gold altar and just ran outside and ran among the people and the plague was stopped? Yeah. Remember the whole nation was yeah. Israel but was healed? Yeah. And, 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 it, and it stopped the plague because he took the fragrance from the gold altar. Now that was in the holy place. But only on the Day of Atonement, somehow the golden altar and the priest himself went through the veil into the Holy of Holies. See, this is a revelation people don't understand. If you study out carefully, you'll find out that the only time that the golden altar went from the holy place to the Holy of Holies was on the Day of Atonement. Wow. Now this is a powerful revelation. You say, why? Because once you enter into the glory... Think about what was in the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron's rod that budded, mm -hmm. blossomed, and produced almonds. Ten commandments. The commandments. And the manna. The manna was preserved in the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, for 33 and a half years, that, 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 that uh, manna and Aaron's rod, they said, abided in the Ark of the Covenant all through the world, and it was preserved. It never aged, it never corrupted, it never went rotten. So glory was literally immortalizing immortalizing Aaron's rod and the manna. It was keeping it immortal. So now the veil has been ripped in two. The same glory that was keeping Aaron's rod from budding and blossoming and producing almonds and the same glory that kept the manna preserved has now entered in. You see, we no longer, you see what happened was you have to understand on the outer court, people are struggling to do ministry. When they come into the, now think about it, we run to services all the time. People say, oh, I need a fresh touch from God. I need more anointing. I need to go get touched over here. And they're running all over the place looking for the healing anointing, looking for a touch from God. It's like every day the priest had to go fill up the oil on the menorah. Who's with me to keep it going? And when the wicks would, get, when the wicks would go down, we'd have to cut off what is dead. Yeah. So every day people are running. I've got to go to this prophet. I need a fresh touch from God. I've got to go over here. I, gotta, I need more oil. I've got to go. Oh, I need the bread of deliverance of the table. Who's with me? I need healing. I need healing. I need healing. And I catch the drift. In the inner court, in the holy place, people are always looking for a fresh anointing. They're always looking for healing. They're always looking. For, but once that praise and worship, that is divinity covered the altar. So if someone comes against you, what I do is I tell people, don't respond with human nature. Respond with what is divine. You see, when you respond with what is divine, you position yourself in the place of worship that takes you into the glory of God. The veil has been torn. When you enter in that place, you're no longer looking for a touch from God. You become the touch of God. Wow. You're no longer looking for healing. You know Jesus, the healer, lives in you. You know out of your belly rivers of healing flow. See, there's a, there's a revelatory realm that once you enter in the glory, you're not looking, you, you know Jehovah Rapha lives in you. You know Jehovah Nisi lives in you. You know that all God is lives in you. And I'm complete in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The revelation is so powerful, is you so can good. preach on it forever. <laughs> hey. uh, we just got a praise report. This lady says she was healed when Warren Hunter prayed for her about 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, she had se severe pain from nerve damage in after chemotherapy and uh, she got healed and it was right here one night right here on Club 36. Wow. Isn't that something? I love that. I love those too. Also, we, we have an urgent <laughs> prayer request. Rabbi Dan Langsing just and with them and they were, he was actually going to go right on the way and they called him in the house and it says, verse 30, when he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and breaking it, he began giving it to them and their eyes were open and they recognized him that he had vanished from their sight and they said to one another watch this were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road when he explained the scriptures to us now notice what happened here if you're watching 
on uh, TV right now. I want you to get a revelation here, which is very, very powerful, because something supernatural happened here. Um, there was an intimacy that took place here, and this is the secret now. Watch this. Let me explain this to you a different way. When we think of the story of Joseph, remember Joseph means to add wisdom. Uh huh. Okay, the Word of God came to Joseph. How did the Word of God come to Joseph? In a form of a dream. Now, this is, this is incredible revelation. Once Joseph gets this dream, Joseph holds on to the dream. When Joseph holds on to the dream, that's like the Word of God. In the story, God doesn't just send anybody. God ends up sending the seed of Keturah and also the seed of Hagar, the Ishmaelites and the Malachites. He sends the, he sends the two seeds, the Midianites, you know what I mean? Because, and he sends the Ishmaelites. Remember, Midian was the firstborn of Keturah, and the Ishmael was of Sarah. Sarah. Okay. So he sends Ishmael the Ishmael. Ishmael is not a Sarah. I mean, I mean, of Hagar. Hagar. Yeah, you're good. Okay. So he sends the two seeds, but these are seeds of Abraham. It's like God will send something that is of him, that has his covenant seed in it, to deliver his dream seed from the pit, to take it where it needs to go. Because one thing that's very important to understand is God always delivers God. Yeah. This is from Isaiah 59, 16. God sought for an intercessor and found none. Therefore, God's own right arm brought salvation for himself. God's own righteousness sustained himself. So it's like wherever God finds... Remember, he doesn't just deliver anybody out of trouble. He delivers the righteous out of trouble. Yes. Amen. You must understand that. God delivers the righteous out of trouble. Mm -hmm. And when you watch the story, you see it grow in power to the point that Joseph's names get changed to Zephaniah, which means God speaks and he lives. And it was funny because I was with... Um, at one of Billy Brim's conferences about a year and a half ago, and she was explaining about how they found the tomb of Joseph, you know, Egypt, archaeological. And in the tomb, they were explaining, that, you know, there's no coffin there, but they were explaining what they found there. One of the things they found was in hieroglyphics, people bowing down to Joseph, actually repeating his name to him, saying Zephaphaneah, which means God speaks and he lives. Think about it. This guy's dream seed ended up taking not only the ability to interpret a dream, it ended up taking on power where it could literally have a voice. Now watch what Joseph has. Wow. Joseph is very strategic because then his brothers who sold him into slavery want to find him. When they come to him, what does he do? It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. Now watch what Joseph does. Joseph cloaks and hides himself. He goes and runs his brothers through this whole test. Finally, the brothers come to him because of Reuben. No, our dad has to have Reuben back. Otherwise, he'll probably die. So remember they all say, we'll all become your slave, Joseph. We'll all, they all bind down before him, we'll, we'll all, and Joseph insists to them, even Joseph himself said, you are all pre to prepare to give your life for your brother. He even asked them, are you all prepared? To, and they, they even acknowledged, they were all prepared to lay down their life on behalf of their brother. What was so amazing is when they manifested the nature of God, mm -hmm. when they manifest the nature of God, for God so loved that he gave his only begotten son, when they manifest the nature of God, at that point God, could not withhold himself.